Hey friends, and welcome back to Kyle Heath Art. I wanted to do something a little bit different with this video. So I went upstairs and I raided my library and I found a big stack of my all-time favorite art books. And so I'm going to go through each of them, tell you what I think about the book, how it's influenced me, and uh, hopefully we'll all have a good time with it. So starting things off, we have Alla Prima 2 by Richard Schmid. Richard Schmid is a bit of a unicorn in some ways because he's an amazing painter, but he's also a good teacher. And those two things don't always necessarily go together. You know, you can have someone who's really, really skilled with something, but they can't necessarily conceptualize their skill down into concepts, you know? <laughs> That's hard business. That's like a whole skill in and of itself. Frankly, I, I think I'm a much better conceptualizer than I am an artist. But Richard Schmidt is this unique character in a sense because he's really good at both. So I really appreciate Richard Schmidt's artwork because um, as you can see, even from this, this picture on the front of the book, Richard had this mastery of like subtlety with paint that was really cool. Like you can tell looking at any of his paintings that like this guy knows paint. He knows what his brush is gonna do he knows what color is going to happen when he mixes. He, he's just a guy that, like, more than anybody else I can think of, Richard Schmidt had cultivated this, like, familiarity and intimacy with art that I think really is clear when you look at his paintings. So that's super cool. And then the other side to his skill is his ability to to present um, his knowledge to somebody, to kind of build a grok, like something that he'd picked up. Richard um, somehow makes art seem really easy. Like, I wouldn't look at any of his paintings and think, like, <laughs> it was an easy painting to do, but when you hear Richard Schmidt talk about art, like, it it somehow comes across that it's just a series of like simple problems to solve. So like, you know, drawing is just uh, getting the line down accurately. Color is just about picking the right color. Values is, you know, judging the light and dark. Edges is, you know, just putting down if the edge is supposed to be fuzzy or sharp. And then through all of that, like just basic decision making, like, Richard Schmid says, like, well, you end up with this thing that looks complex and lifelike and amazing. And that was really mind boggling to me, especially as someone who, like, frankly, I don't think I'm necessarily like talented in art by any means, but I do have something of a knack of taking other people's systems and just kind of practicing them. I'm a pretty disciplined guy. And so Richard Schmidt, in a lot of ways, opened the door to me uh, to a way of art practice that was kind of guided by just basic decisions. And in the end, um, finding that you've made something that's like really beautiful, really lifelike, super cool. Another thing I really appreciate about Richard Schmidt is um, something you pick up by reading the book. He's got a way of talking that's just it's funny. <laughs> He's like kind of a folksy guy, maybe is a good way to, to put it. But you know, a better way to put it is he he's kind of original in the way he speaks. Like, you know, I, I talked a moment ago about how like Richard Schmidt has this like originality in how he paints, but like somehow that originality also extends over into the way he talks. He... I don't know if it's like he's got these like idiomatic phrases that no one's ever heard of before. <laughs> it it kind of comes off as like, hmm, this pie is slap your grandma good. Not that he said that. Not that anybody should say that. Don't slap your grandma. 
But um, <laughs> Richard Schmidt is kind of an original speaker, and that is super refreshing to me. That's something I really prize as an author. Like, frankly, I'm, I'm a much more talented author than I, I ever will be an artist. And um, so Richard has that thing that I really value in my own writing, which is to kind of say something new. It's really common for all of us to speak by just kind of cobbling together, like common tropes of speech, common ways of talking. You really note that, like turned up to 11 if you go to a church service or a political convention or something. Like everybody kind of sounds the same. And um, Richard Schmidt, I feel, has something of that refreshing originality in how he speaks. Moving on to our next book, we have... This is just a sketch collection by an artist named Kim Jung Gi. And um, again, speaking kind of on the topic of originality, Kim Jung Gi is like nobody else. Rather than like cobbling together art, Kim Jung Gi kind of just, he almost makes things appear just out of nowhere. If you've ever seen videos of Kim Jung Gi creating it, it's like a whole performance. The guy has no reference at all. From what I can tell, he never draws from reference. So he takes his brush pen and this giant blank sheet of paper. He maybe starts from some arbitrary location like this uh, you know, lovely woman's knee. And <laughs> he like draws out of there and creates something that's like complex, accurate, Looks like it sits in space. It's like totally amazing. So I really appreciate that about him. Um, it makes me want to practice more, like drawing from my own imagination. It makes me want to observe the world I'm in more closely because he's just, uh, yeah, like nobody else. Really inspiring to me. Okay, next we have Figure Drawing for Artists by Steve Houston. I do a lot of figure drawing, and I wouldn't say that I learned figure drawing from books, but in, in terms of a person who I think most fits the, the spirit that I bring to figure drawing, Steve Houston um, is definitely up there. He's got this thing where he he makes something that is truly lifelike, that has like a real sense of form and comes from very simplistic concepts. But at the same time, Steve Houston has like a real life and energy that's frankly very rare for figure drawing artists. As a figure artist and I guess as a representational artist in general, it can be really easy to get hung up and fixated on accuracy, right? Like really getting the thing correct. And the inevitable outcome of that kind of fixation is your drawing ends up looking really stiff. Like you just, you just accuracy the life out of <laughs> that thing. And Steve Houston somehow like, is able to convey that the thing is like a really realistic, accurate form, but he's got the energy too. The way he does that is he kind of bounces off these two, like almost like a yin and yang kind of concept of um, form and gesture. I think that's the language he uses. He uses something like that. But in his, uh, in his book, like each chapter kind of like ping pongs, between those two things. So you've got one chapter that's focused on like an accuracy kind of thing. And then the next chapter, it's gonna bunk back into like, okay, let's talk about flow again. Let's talk about that aspect of drawing that like combines parts together to create like a coherence. And he bounces between those like, and the outcome is you, you get a drawing that has like a lot of oomph and energy and, and life into it. I think that's really cool. Um, 
most influential for me was, was frankly not Steve Houston's book, but his um, lecture series. I think it's New Masters Academy that has it. But man, if you want to like know how the human figure works and like a great way to simplify things, uh, gosh, that's like a fire hose of <laughs> knowledge. <laughs> really good, really good guy. All right, this next strange book apparently doesn't even have words on it, and I uh, I won't bury the lead here. This is actually my most recent book. Um, it's called How to Write This Book, and no joke, it really is one of my favorite art books. The whole shtick behind this one was, all right, How to Write This Book. It was me figuring out uh, here I am in a state of like intense burnout, but like a real desire to be creative. How am I going to write this book? I decided to, to answer that question. I would just write the book. And through the process of writing it, um, I would discover like what creativity really is, how it grows, how it can be nurtured, and just the nature of the thing that comes out of you. Where do things come from inside you, right? Does it come out of your brain? Does it come out of your soul? What's a soul? <laughs> Maybe you could call this a philosophy book. I don't know. But I think it's a fun, light read. And frankly, every time I go back to it, um, I still like reading it. So yeah, I'll put this as one of my top art books on creativity. Next, we've got a book that uh, might not strike you necessarily as an art book uh, first. This is Ways of Seeing by John Berger. And this is a real interesting book. I love when I come across weird books from weird people who just see the world differently. Seeing is a really interesting subject to me. Ostensibly, artists should be like authorities on seeing, right? <laughs> That's like what you do with art is you see a thing and then you recreate it. But I think, frankly, I'm, I'm not sure a book really has been written that really does do credit to the skill and quality of what it is to see something. With art, a lot of times we, uh, we're kind of stuck on just seeing incidental details of our reference, right? Like uh, judging the shape of the, this person we're trying to paint, judging what color their skin tone is and stuff. And like, you know, that's seeing. That's what seeing means as an artist. But every once in a while you get other artists that talk about seeing differently. Like, um... Like Cezanne, for instance. If you read some of Cezanne's stuff, it, sometimes it seems like he's talking about something a little bit different when he talks about seeing. Something a little bit more of like seeing the essence of something or something like that. I don't know. I don't know how to talk about this subject yet, but I'm hoping by like the eighth book I've written, I'll have something I can say about it. But this guy kind of gets into that territory for me of starting to open up to let's call it a new frontier of ways of seeing the feeling i get from reading this book is that most of us are attuned to just a very small subset of ways of seeing the world but perhaps there are way way more ways of seeing out there that we are unaware of and perhaps that nobody's even practiced yet that's real vague and abstract, but um, I found this book very fascinating for that reason. And you know, it is about art. You know, this is a picture a painting by Magritte. So generally he does use uh, works of art to get his points across about seeing. All right, next on our list, we have The Art Spirit by Robert Henry. If you'd followed me for any length of time, you know I'm a big fan of this guy. <laughs> I think Robert Henry um, has made almost like a Bible of art <laughs> with this book. 
Maybe that's something I shouldn't say. I don't know. Is it wrong to say that? Let's just go with it. Every time I read this book, I end up underlining like everything that I read. And this book has this interesting quality that I think all good spiritual literature has, which is that the second time you go to it, you find something different. The third time you go to it, it speaks to you in a different way. You didn't notice it. It didn't hit you the first time. But at a subsequent read, it just, I don't know, it's almost like spiritual books have this generalization, generalization about them where somehow they can speak to uh, any incidentals. So that's a really cool thing about this book. And it's about art. Like, you know, most of what he's talking about is painting, but um, he does something that most art books don't do, which is uh, he speaks a lot about the artist rather than the art. Now that's a book I'm going to write at some point, really flesh that out. But that's interesting, right? He talks about the artist, cultivation of the artist that creates the artwork. I think that is a very unique direction that um, is, is frankly not on anybody's mind right now, as far as I can tell. Another cool thing about this book, um, one of my favorite takeaways, is uh, what he says about techniques. Robert Henry says that um, rather than cobbling together techniques uh, from other artists to you know, make your work, the techniques should just emerge out of your own natural practice. That's how you get something that you can call self-expression rather than just, I, I don't know, <laughs> something that's not you, I guess. Like for example, if, if I really love Kim Jong-gi and I wanted to create art that looked like Kim Jong-gi, I could study his techniques. I could learn how to draw from the imagination the way that Kim Jong-gi does. I could do it so hard that I end up being better at making Kim Jong-gi art than Kim Jong-gi was, <laughs> you know? But in the end, what I'm doing is, is not really coming out of me. It's coming out of a technique that I cultivated over long periods of time. Obviously, there's nothing wrong with that, but... Um, to me, what is interesting is that there's a whole other thing about art. Frankly, I, I think the reason why art was created was as a means of self-expression, as a means of expressing your own spirit inside of you, um, rather than cobbling together techniques. And so Robert Henry kind of suggests, at least my takeaway is like, if you do your thing, if you create the stuff that interests you, that you find compelling, then techniques are going to be created out of whole cloth from your practice, rather than the other way around, where you're, you're seeking out techniques to make something uh, cool. All right, continuing with spiritual books, we have a book that Again, doesn't seem like it fits in this list of art books at all. Zen and Japanese Culture by D.T. Suzuki. One of the things I think is really cool about Zen is if you look at the history of a lot of Zen masters, after they've had moments of, I don't know, deep insight or something like that, a lot of times the outcome is they get really creative. It's funny, like I've seen the pattern over and over again in my reading. You, you get an insight in, in Zen and like, I don't know, you get good at making stuff. <laughs> so this, this book kind of gives you some of that. The way the book is arranged is interesting. It, each chapter is like a different art. So it is a book about art. Um, so, for example, you've got a chapter about like the art of sword fighting and how that's tied to the ethos of Zen. You've got a chapter of how to make good cups of tea, etc., etc. So this is an interesting one. Then again, another Zen book. We've got the Zen of Creativity by John Dido Lurie. 
Now, frankly, most of the time when I see a book like this, I want to barf. It's, um, <laughs> I don't know what it is about it. Cultivating your artistic life. Something about um, that presentation uh, gives me the icks a little bit. But this book does not give me the icks. This man does not give me the icks. Um, I love this book. I think it's really cool. This book, um, again, has given me just a little bit more of a picture of what it would mean to kind of what I was talking about with Richard Schmidt of developing a sense of intimacy with the medium, right? Like I talked about how Richard Schmidt just knew paint. And this guy, he's a photographer, so the context of this book is photography. And this guy, the intimacy is with the subject of his photos. So as an artist, you know, that would be, um, you know, the, the model, the apple that you're painting, whatever. This guy, for me, has opened up a little bit of an idea of what it would mean to develop a practice, even like an internal uh, stance with your subject, where um, a kind of deeper familiarity can kind of start to emerge out of the practice. And from that, there's a certain power in your art that comes out. Uh, je ne sais quoi, that doesn't necessarily have to do with the incidentals of your art. So there's that. And then finally, the last book on the list. This is The Goat, the greatest of all time. In my opinion, the best art book that has ever been made. No joke. This is Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain by Betty Edwards. I owe a lot to this blessed woman. I don't think I would be even doing art if it weren't for this book. I would have quit in high school, and I don't think I ever would have picked it up again. This book, to me, demystifies art in a way that no other book has. Betty Edwards' big argument, maybe, my take is that art is not hard. It is not something that uh, is a mysterious gift that is only bestowed on a small number of talented geniuses. Her argument is that art is just a human thing, and frankly, it's not really that difficult if you got the right uh, brain space for it, <laughs> right? The right side of the brain. So... Psychologically, you know, a left-brained person would be someone who's extremely analytical, maybe, and a right-brained person would be someone who's very creative. And she uses that kind of language to suggest that it may be a lot of the reasons why drawing is hard for us is because we're just so judgmental about um, the rightness and wrongness about what we're drawing. And that just kind of muddies up the, the actual process of doing the drawing. So Betty Edwards has like all these practices and um, exercises that you can do that she's oriented to kind of like shake you up into like a flow state where the, the part of your brain that's really judgmental just kind of shuts up <laughs> for a minute and you're just drawing. And out of that, you, you end up drawing a lot better. Turns out a whole lot better. So for example, she'll have exercises where you like, you draw something upside down. Like not your upside down, but the thing you're drawing is upside down. <laughs> and that way you're not looking at that and saying like, oh, that's a nose and I don't know how to draw noses. Instead, you're like drawing the angles. And she's got all kinds of exercises like that. She has things where you draw the negative space instead of the actual thing, etc., etc. I won't blow it for you. Buy the book if you're interested. And one of the things that really blew my mind was um, she would task you with these frankly difficult tasks. Like, she'll have you draw your own hand. Your hand is like the definition of a hard thing to draw, right? You've got all these, like, dangly things going all over the place, like, how do you draw that? That's hard. But somehow, 
when you get into the brain space that she helps you cultivate, or you're just you're judging angles, right? You're looking at lines. You're comparing how big is the space on my paper compared to the space that I'm looking at. Somehow when you get into that zone where you're just kind of mathing it, <laughs> almost, before you know it, you've ended up with an accurate drawing of a hand. It's like, it's magic. <laughs> it's magic. So this book is magic, and that is why I call this my favorite art book. So thank you guys for listening and watching. I hope you enjoyed that. It was a lot of fun for me to revisit some of these books that I haven't read in a minute. And uh, just remember why I'm thankful for them and how they've uh, influenced my art life. So hope you guys enjoyed that. Thanks a lot and uh, peace. Mm -hmm.